Well, hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together about 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists in over 80 countries worldwide. And today we're privileged to hear from Dr. Anthony Latham speaking on the enigma of consciousness. So Anthony, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on ICMDA webinars. Uh, consciousness, the enigma of consciousness. You may be confused already by that title because uh, consciousness is a, a slippery thing and it's hard to define. And we're not talking here about the medical levels of consciousness, the Glasgow Coma Score and that kind of stuff, but the actual phenomenon of what it is to be a conscious person. Descartes famously proposed a dualism where the mind is a distinct substance from the body even if intimately interacting with it. And indeed, since Descartes, philosophers have struggled to explain how something purely physical could have free will, emotions, sensations, and personhood. And what this webinar will do is to discuss what this means for us as Christian clinicians who know that we and our patients are more than just bodies, but are also souls. Dr. Anthony Latham is a, a general practitioner, originally from Dublin in Ireland, but now living on the Isle of Harris, which is uh, off the, uh, the, the west coast of Scotland. Uh, he has worked in Kenya uh, and then with his family as a missionary in Tanzania prior to general practice in the Western Isles of Scotland. He's had an interest in philosophy of mind and consciousness for many years, and actually written a book on the subject called The Enigma of Consciousness, Reclaiming the Soul. And when you get, we'll give you uh, details about that when we write to you. Anthony has an MA in bioethics and medical law, and he also chairs the Scottish Council on Human Bioethics, which gives a, a, a Christian worldview perspective on a whole range of different uh, bioethical issues. So, Anthony, it's a pleasure to have you today on ICMDA webinars, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'll just share my screen now. So I hope that that's visible to you. Um, my personal interest in this subject began about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I became rather fascinated with what consciousness is. And uh, I'm, indeed, I did a short course on philosophy of mind shortly after that. And then I, I ended up writing a book about it called The Enigma of Consciousness. Now, Christians have differing views on this subject. Most don't perhaps know a great deal about it. It's quite a bewildering and difficult subject to talk about even if perhaps they've heard of the philosopher Descartes and the dualism that's named after him, that's uh, Cartesian dualism, which I'll try and explain later. Within philosophy, the study of consciousness is one of the most vibrant and controversial topics. Of particular interest for us as Christians and clinicians is how all this relates to the belief that we're not just physical beings, but have souls. It also relates very much to what happens after we die. Is there evidence of a non-physical aspect to us as humans? And as scientists and clinicians, we tend, if you're anything like me, to strongly believe in the natural order of things. How could we bring in supernatural ideas into what makes us persons? And I too considered for most of my clinical life uh, as a Christian, that my thoughts were simply the result of physical brain activity. Is this just a world view that we easily fall into based on a purely material universe? Is there nothing else in nature but material things? Studying consciousness opens up avenues for us to assert that we're not just lumps of matter. So what is consciousness? For clinicians, we tend to think about the Glasgow Coma Scale and levels of consciousness, but this is something quite different. In fact, you have a form of consciousness when you're dreaming. Consciousness is notoriously hard to define. Some people say it's something it is like to be conscious. In fact, it can't really be described in physical terms at all. 
Most of us don't think about what our consciousness is, rather like a fish not knowing that they're in water. Let's look at some of the unique characteristics of consciousness. First of all, it's private. Another way is to say that you, are, you have privileged access to your own conscious thoughts. No one else can have your thoughts or feelings. Now, this itself is very interesting when you think about it. Physical things, machines, computers, etc., do not have this private or privileged phenomenon. Even an advanced computer can be analyzed physically to understand exactly what's going on inside. Okay, you might ask, Perhaps if we knew enough about the brain, we would also understand consciousness. I'll try to show why this seems very unlikely. So we have privileged access to our minds, and this is one of the unique things about us. Consciousness also involves a sense of personhood. I know myself over time as an individual person, and we know other people as persons. Now, while personhood may be quite hard to define, we intuitively know what it is. A physical object, however complicated, could not be a person. I certainly would maintain that, and many others would. Could a computer perhaps be a person, like the computer called Howl in the film 2001 Space Odyssey? There are good reasons to say no, and I'll discuss computers later. What about the sensations that we experience? Simply the sensation of seeing a color such as red is an extraordinary thing. We don't merely register a certain wavelength, a computer or a physical sensor could do that easily. We have an actual experience of redness. And the same with the smell of coffee, the sound of the wind, the pain in my foot. We may know the neurological pathways and the physiology, but can we know anything physical about the actual experience? Many philosophers would say you can't. Most would even say that we will never have a physical description of a sensation experience. Now, experiences of sensation and their phenomenal quality seem in a totally different category from anything physical. It's rather like asking how heavy is the number seven? It's just a, a non-question. Now, there's a famous thought experiment known as Mary's Room. Now, Mary, you have to imagine, is a world expert on the physiology and the anatomy and the molecular intricacies of vision. Let's say she literally knows everything about physical vision, down to the last subatomic particle. But Mary has grown up and stayed in a room that is only black and white. She's never seen any color, even though she knows all about how color vision works. One day she goes out of the room and she sees lots of color. So here's the crunch. Mary knows all the physical facts about vision. Mary has experienced a new fact about vision. Therefore, not all facts about vision are physical. So that's something to think about. Einstein said, science cannot tell us the taste of chicken soup. And I think he was right. And then there are emotions. Things such as fear, sadness, love. And these are deeply personal and very real. The issue then is, can a physical object have emotions? Now, a computer might mimic emotion because someone programs it to do so. But does it experience emotion, say, sadness? Most philosophers would say no. Emotions are in fact indefinable in physical terms. There are then what philosophers called intentional thinking. These are thoughts about things. Examples include hopes and beliefs. A belief is always about something. I might have a belief that it's going to rain tomorrow. So that is about rain. I'm maybe thinking about my wife. But think about it, a physical system cannot be about anything. Neither a stone nor even a piece of complex tissue such as a brain can be about anything. So this aboutness seems to separate intentional thought from anything physical. Now, David Chalmers is a, a very well-known philosopher of mind. and He 
said, there is something it is like to see a vivid green, to feel a sharp pain, to visualize the Eiffel Tower, to feel a deep regret, and to feel that one is late. Each of these states has a phenomenal character with phenomenal qualities, or sometimes known as qualia, characterizing what it is like to be in the state. There's therefore what philosophers call an explanatory gap between consciousness and brain activity. And it's known as the hard problem in philosophy of mind, a term that Chalmers uh, coined himself. It's fair to say that this hard problem has not been solved by the best minds. It goes something like this. Physical accounts explain at most structure and function, but explaining structure and function does not suffice to explain consciousness. Therefore, no physical account can explain consciousness. Socrates, if we go back now through some of the philosophers, Socrates said that the user of a thing and the thing being used are always separate and distinct. So if you decide to move your arm, for instance, you are quite different from anything physical. Descartes, who lived mostly in the 17th century, he is considered to be the, modern, the father of modern philosophy. And he declared in his famous work, The Meditations, that there are two kinds of substances, mind and matter. And these are distinct, but crucially, they interact with each other in both directions. Mind, he said, cannot be divided, whereas matter can. Mind is indivisible, whereas matter can be divided, including any part of the body. He also said that mind is not extended in space. Yeah, in other words, it doesn't have physical dimensions, unlike the body, including the brain. And therefore, he was a dualist, a so-called Cartesian dualist after his name. It's also called substance dualism. In, in contrast, a monist believes that there's only one substance, that's a physical one. Well-known philosophers who would come under this heading of substance dualists, like Descartes, include Alvin Plantinga, Richard Swinburne, William Lane Craig, and J.P. Moreland. It's important for us to emphasize that Descartes does not play down the importance of the physical body. Rather, he said the mind is intimately linked with the body. Now, some Christians feel unhappy with the idea of an autonomous mind, for instance, changing gender without acknowledging your biological sex. But we don't need to ignore biology by being a dualist. Substance dualism can entail a complete, although contingent, unity between the mind and the body. And ever since Descartes, philosophers, mainly atheist philosophers, have been trying to undermine this idea of a non-material aspect of the mind. How could something non-material have any effect on the physical brain? This would seem to go against any laws of physics. The great philosopher Leibniz also believed in a non-material mind, and he imagined the brain to be like a machine, even much more complex than this mill, like a machine, like a mill. He asked, how could the pieces or the components of such a mill ever have perceptions, feelings, or thoughts? Now, a very quick tour through some of the major ideas concerning the mind over the centuries. First of all, behaviorism, which was quite popular in the early 20th century, but is now very much out of fashion says that mental events are nothing more than the observed behavior that you see. So if you have a pain, it's just the grimace, the shout, the withdrawal, all these things. In other words, what you actually observe. They wanted to be able to observe anything and did not admit that there was anything internal. But of course, it says nothing inter about the internal states of our minds, which are very real. Type identity theory, says that mental events are nothing more than the physical biological processes. So a pain is the firing of certain nerve fibers, such as say C fibers. There are many problems with this. It doesn't really explain the phenomenon of our experience of pains or other sensations. 
And we can even imagine other species feeling pain who don't have the same C fibers. Functionalism, mental states here are viewed as inputs and outputs from different brain states. A bit like a machine with parts that can be in different relationships. It's a monist view, in other words, only physical. There are many objections to this also. It has nothing to do with intentional thoughts or experiences, and it seems very mechanical. Where is consciousness in it? Epiphenomenalism. This is a form of dualism, but not the same as Descartes. It's a type of what's called property dualism. Mental states are somehow different from physical states, the non-physical, but they are entirely produced by and have their origin in the brain, so-called supervenient on the brain activity. However, in this view, mental states are quite inert. They cannot act upon the brain. But this goes against our experience completely. This is the thoughts that initiate physical actions. I decide to move my arm by first thinking about it. And lastly, eliminativism. Uh, which says that mental states actually don't exist at all. There are quite a few philosophers who believe this. All psychology in this view is described in purely neuroscientific terms. It's the most fiercely reductionist view. One day they imagine we'll be able to communicate simply by examining another person's brain. It denies what we experience as real feelings and emotions. It's not accepted by most philosophers, and you could try and think through this. Could you fall in love with someone by just looking into their brain? There are quite a few other isms, some of them overlapping, and there's far too much to go into today. What about artificial intelligence? Can we reproduce consciousness in a computer? Now, some think that we will, but there are big issues with this. Computers run on symbols, usually zeros and ones. It's the same with writing. Letters are symbols. Symbols convey ideas, but they're not the ideas themselves. Actually, the ideas come from humans. You may have heard of what's called the Turing test devised by the famous mathematician and computer science scientist, Alan Turing. In this test, a computer called a Turing machine is put in one room and is asked by question, questions by somebody who can't see it in another room and it gives replies to that person. Now, if the person giving the questions can't actually distinguish between a computer and a human, then the test is passed. So far, no computer has come near passing this, but even if, if it did, would this be consciousness? A philosopher well-known called John Searle says, no, this would not be consciousness. I'll just move back to this picture. He said that no computer could be conscious. And he has this famous, what's called Chinese room thought experiment. Computer outputs are based on symbols which have no meaning in themselves. They merely represent meaning which is inputted by a mind. There's no thought involved. Searle so explained the concept by drawing an analogy using Chinese Mandarin. And the definition hinges on the thin line between actually having a mind and simulating a mind, which is what a computer does. So it goes like this. Suppose you have this closed room. You can see a picture of the chap in that with a non-Chinese speaker with a list of Mandarin characters and an instruction book. But this book explains in detail all the rules according to which the sequences of Chinese characters may be formed, but without giving the meaning of the characters. Suppose now that we pass to this man through a hole in the wall, see this person on the left, in the form of a question in Chinese Mandarin, which he's to answer by following the rules he's learned. So the sequence passed to him from the outside is a question and the completion is an answer. Now this non-Chinese speaker masters this sequencing game so much that even a native Chinese speaker will not be able to spot any difference in the answers given by this man in an enclosed room. But the fact remains that not only is he not Chinese, but he doesn't even understand Chinese, far less think about it. 
think in it. Now, the argument goes on, a machine, even a Turing machine, is just like this man, it, in that it does nothing more than follow the rules given in an instruction book, that is the program. It doesn't understand the meaning of the questions given to it, nor its own answers. And thus it can't be thinking. And so if we accept that a book such as that book of instructions has no mind of its own, we cannot then endow a computer with intelligence and remain consistent. What about neurology and MRI scans? You may ask, where are different areas of the brain show activity for different thoughts. Is this not proof that the brain is all that is needed for thought? Well, here we have to really discuss the difference between correlation and identity. An example would be when you see a car uh, driving along the road, you may not be able to see the driver. You see the car moving, but behind the wheel is a mind that is the driver. It is a simple explanation, a simple um, picture, if you like, of what it is considered to be possible with the brain, the brain being the hardware, the mind being behind it. So when you see something lit up in the MRI scan, it doesn't mean that that is the actual thoughts. It is certainly correlated with it though. There's a well-known, uh, rather out of date operation that is done on what is called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum, as you will know, is the connecting, uh, the connective fibers between the two cerebral hemispheres of the brain. And this used to be done for certain uh, severe epilepsies where this was actually divided surgically. Now, if the person is only the brain, then we should have two persons in one head if both hemispheres are isolated. And there are certainly neurological consequences to this operation, but there is actually no change at all in personality. In all cases, one person remains intact. So that's something to think about uh, when we ask, where is the person? You might ask, what about dementia? and other diseases of the brain where somebody's personality might change. I would argue, and I've certainly thought about this a lot as a GP uh, dealing with people with dementia, I would argue that the soul of the person is intact, but that the machinery, the hardware is failing. Free will, are we free? The brain is a physical object and therefore subject, of course, to the laws of physics. Therefore, if all we are is our brain, then every brain state must follow these laws. Now, any brain state is a result of prior conditions and purely physical inputs. There's no freedom in this, in a purely materialistic view. Free will, in fact, is impossible in such a scenario. Even if you bring up quantum indeterminacy, there's no freedom in that either. There, in this situation, in fact, you wouldn't be responsible for any of your actions. A criminal would not be able to do anything else but be a criminal. Even a heroic act, perhaps in war, would not be anything but predetermined neurological activity. And all our ideas of freedom would be illusory. But we do believe in free will. And as Christians, we know that we can decide to do good or bad. And the only way it seems to solve this issue, and it is a burning issue, I can tell you in philosophy of mind circles, is to have a non-physical mind that is not subject to the laws of physics and therefore has autonomy to make real choices. And free will is perhaps the most difficult subject for the materialist to unravel. And there, as I said, is an ongoing battle of ideas over free will. Some philosophers, pure materialists who are would say, at least honestly, that they think free will doesn't exist at all and it's just an illusion. What about evolution? We have to ask, uh, why do we have consciousness at all? Because if you think about it, a non-conscious creature could easily survive and reproduce, possibly even more effectively. And it is in, in fact a puzzle as to why we have consciousness at all. 
in evolutionary theory. Secondly, whatever your views may be on evolution, a pure materialist would have to agree that our neurology is honed for just for survival and for passing on of our genes, not for knowing the truth of things. But, and it's worth reading Alvin Plantinga, the philosopher on this one. If that is the case, our beliefs could be quite false. In fact, the likelihood of our beliefs being true would be really quite low, even belief in a purely blind and purposeless form of evolution. This is one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis. How could an idiotic universe have produced creatures whose mere dreams are so much stronger, better, subtler than itself? Let's move on to some verses from scripture to see if we can be helped through that. And I, I have to say this will be very brief and inadequate, but I think it's good to, to look at a few verses. We read in Genesis 35, when Rachel, Jacob's wife, was dying, and as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. The key, key phrase there for us is, and as her soul was departing. Of course, her body did not then depart, but her soul did. You, of course, know the words from, of Jesus uh, on the cross to the thief who was dying beside him. And he said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, the thief was shortly after that dead. His body would have been thrown onto a rubbish heap, probably. But he was going to be with Jesus in paradise. This is one of the key verses, I believe, uh, concerning the soul. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, Jesus said. Clearly distinguishing between the body and the soul. And then uh, we read in Acts as Stephen was being stoned, and just before he died, he said, as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Or the part of the soul, you might say, that is in communication with God. When our body dies, we don't go into oblivion. And we also know that as Christians, that God is not physical. And he has thoughts and intentions and emotions. He has, if you like, the mind. And we are made in his image with minds. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, Jesus said. And at the final resurrection, the New Testament teaches that we will be reunited with transformed bodies. That might be a great mystery, but that's what we are told. And as physicians, we are dealing with other human beings made in his image who are not simply accidental material objects, however complex. They are persons made in the image of God with souls and therefore of inestimable worth. And I think that studying consciousness is not just an academic exercise, however fascinating it may be. It makes us realize the mystery and the wonder of what a human being is. And I hope that this quite inadequate summary will encourage you in a world where blind and purposeless physicalism seems to reign. We are dealing with real souls who have an eternal future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. We've been listening to Dr. Anthony Latham speaking on the enigma of consciousness. A question, first of all, uh, through, through the Q&A, uh, about animals, or it comes back to animals. Your description mm. of consciousness, Anthony, seems to have aspects mm. of learning or development with a degree of de-learning, in, in, for example, in dementia. And a computer would be unable to do this creatively or independently. A baby might have a less developed consciousness, a person in a vegetative state, little or no consciousness, as far as we know. 
Would you call learning and planning phenomena in the animal work also consciousness, or does it need to have an ethical framework uh, for for it? So I, I guess the question is, is around what sort of consciousness, if any, that animals uh, do animals have? Do they have the same experiences as us? I guess we don't have private access to <laughs> to know that. But but uh, your thoughts on that? I think people vary in their views on this. I, I uh, Descartes did not think that animals had consciousness. I personally think they do have a form of consciousness, uh, which is different from ours in each case. Um, and I think it's a mystery, you know, when you go back, uh, when you go down to the level of bacteria and come up to insects and so on. But if, you, if you're talking about uh, your pet dog, for instance, it's very hard to say that that dog hasn't got some sort of emotions and feelings in 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 a, in a sort of parallel way to what we have. And so, um, as regards learning, yes, I think um, I, I know that there are computer programs that learn as uh, as they go along. But I'm sure you're right um, that le learning in the way humans do involves something which is quite indefinable in physical terms. Thank you. I, I think it was Bertrand Russell, wasn't it, who said uh, that a fisherman once told him that fish had neither sense nor sensation, but how he knew this, he could not tell him. <laughs> <laughs> so a question here from uh, Kenneth Tan. Kenneth uh, is saying uh, he's an Indonesian medical student currently doing a clinical clerkship. Uh, can we ever describe psychosomatic or somatopsychic disorders with greater detail in regards to their pathophysiology? How do mind and body interact where they do meet? Is there a more detailed explanation? Well, as you probably know from my talk, um, those of us who are what's called substance stewardess, broadly speaking, um, believe that there is this non-physical part of us soul, which there's a lot of huge amount of evidence for uh, that I hope has been helpful. As regards how we interact with the body um, as souls and then physical brains and bodies, I, I honestly think this is quite a mystery. There's no question as, a, as, a doc, as doctors and clinicians, we, we do see the most extraordinary um, physical manifestations of mental uh, disorders. And so there is this tight link, really, really tight link between the soul and the body um, that I would really want to emphasize. We're not talking about some free, uh, completely autonomous uh, part of us, but uh, when we see somebody who's literally paralyzed because of some severe tra traumatic event, then, then we, we, we have to say they're intimately linked and these manifestations just show that. But how? That is a mystery. Jonathan Buckley's picking up on this question of mental health disorders again. How does this speak to mental health disorders? For example, dissociated identity disorder, functional neurological syndromes, delusional beliefs or phenomenology of psychotic states. Are these disorders of mind uh, or brain uh, or soul or body or at the interface of both or is it a mystery? Look, I, I I'm definitely would have to talk about mystery in these things and I think anyone who, who is honest would say that as well. But in a lot of these things that he's just mentioned, there would be a, a physical aspect to it. Um, this is why certain medications will actually help. And so if the hardware, the brain, is um, disordered in some fashion, then what you see and what the experience of that person will be may well be disordered simply from physical reasons. And it's beyond me, and I think for most people to say uh, whether the, the soul of that person is in some sense completely well or intact. I think there's a complete, total intimate connection between the soul and the brain. And 
uh, we have to deal with mystery. It's probably not very well replied to that question. It's a very good one, though, which you need to ponder. Thank you. Uh, another anonymous question here. You, you've got sympathy, as you've said already, for Cartesian dualism, René Descartes' mm -hmm. idea of substance dualism, in the way that you interpret Bible verses relating to a separate and material part of our being of the soul. What reason is there not to believe in the pre-existence of the souls, which I assume you do not, says the uh, questioner, but the soul would only begin to exist once a new person is formed by the material union of ovum and yeah. spermatozoa. And I, I know that some, mm. some uh, religions do believe in the pre-existence of souls. I think Mormons believe in the mm. pre-existence of souls, but we don't as, as Christians. So your reflections mm -hmm. on that? I think so. I may be wrong, but I think some of the early church fathers even believed in, in pre-existence of souls. But uh, no, I don't think there's any evidence for that. And um, a, the we are created beings, including our souls. It's not like our souls always existed. Uh, even though God may know about us before we're born, and we know that from the prophet Jeremiah and the psalmists and so on that uh, he already knew you before you were born, but that doesn't mean you existed before you were born. So, uh, and it is a mystery as to how the soul and the body unite and when, but um, I take it to be because the soul is non-physical, it doesn't depend on the brain for its existence. And therefore, we shouldn't be looking at the development of the brain in the embryo as the time when the soul it becomes into being. Um, uh, the soul could have been there from the very moment of conception, as far as I'm concerned. So rather, rather like, well, perhaps at the other end of life, the person with dementia, you've got the soul is present, but the, the hardware is simply not developed in a way that it can find expression. and. That might be true at the beginning of life as well. There and may be, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think in dementia, it is really difficult and people say, well, look, so-and-so's uh, personality changed and everything. I think the, the hardware has an effect on uh, disinhibiting, for instance, and uh, all sorts of regulation of, of the thoughts. Um, and therefore you obviously do get changes. But I have to say, um, and you will probably think of many exceptions to this, but amongst Christians who, who get dementia, there, there's often a continuance of the love of prayer, the love of hymns, love of um, uh, worship, that sort of thing, which, which seems to shine through the dementia. And that, that to me is an indication of the continuance of that person as an intact soul. Yes, and, and often times of, of enhanced cognition almost, that the person seems to drift away and then comes back, sometimes right yeah. at the end, and, and, and mm -hmm. says things that you weren't expecting. So it's mm -hmm. fascinating. The, I guess this also raises the question of what theologians call the intermediate state, because mm -hmm. uh, we are in soul bodies or embodied souls, mm -hmm. Uh, then we we die our, our spiritual soul departs as you mentioned in the in the passages that mm. you you brought up with regard to rachel's death and also the thief on the cross as well mm. but then in the new heaven and the new earth we're raised as resurrected bodies aren't we so presumably we have both brains and minds as well um and yet as you pointed out god himself uh, has no body but does have a mind or Christ of course mm -hmm. had a body but, but God mm -hmm. the Father ha has a mind yeah. but no body so uh, is there anything much that we can know about the so-called intermediate state you know what, what happens after the soul departs between that time and when the uh, the body is uh, the mind is clothed with a new body and, and is there consciousness <laughs> During <laughs> during that time, you know that people talk about the difference yeah. between um, you know uh, uh, real hell and and the kind of holding mm -hmm. beforehand and so on. 
your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, well, we're, we're now into theology. I'm not a theologian, although it is a fascinating subject. I think my view and that of many conservative Christians would say that the soul does go uh, from the body and exists. The person doesn't disintegrate uh, and sort of uh, become nothing, but continues. Um, now, we, it, it, this is a mystery, and Paul talk, talks about it as a mystery, doesn't he? Um, but we will all be changed uh, at the, the last day, and in some miraculous fashion, we will have reconstituted bodies, heavenly bodies. Uh, but there is an in-between state before the Lord comes back. Now, what that state is, that's that's not my subject, and it's uh, I think it's uh, something you can ponder about, but there are things we're not meant to know, I think, perhaps, and that's one of them. Yes, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That, that mm -hmm. um, verse from 1 Corinthians 15, I remember, was inscribed on the walls of the nursery at All Nations Christian College. You have to think about that. We will not all sleep, oh, yes. but we will be, we will all be yeah. changed. Yeah. So uh, My Michael Claydon is, is asking, uh, saying thank you for your talk. What implications does this have for brainstem death tests? Uh, and he refers to the recent high profile case in the UK of Archie Battersby, mm. which not all of our uh, listeners may, may be aware of, but this was a boy mm. who was, there was some debate about whether he was fully brain dead or whatever, and whether his ventilator should be switch, switched off. But um, uh, I guess what Michael is getting at is, is does the soul leave uh, an oxygenated corpse at some stage or, or uh, does the death of the soul uh, and the departure of the soul only mm. happen? You know when full brainstem death has has occurred. I wish I knew all the answers to these questions. I mean, this is this is a really difficult territory. Um, I personally would say that the soul is present. That's that's just uh, because the body is still alive, even though the brain itself may not be functioning. Um, because the soul is not the same as the brain. And so that's, that's where I am. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's unimaginable what uh, the relation the relatives have to go through in trying to work out what, what to do and what not to do in these situations. But um, I don't have a clear and easy answer to that. I'm not sure that anybody has, actually. I guess a related question is is the phenomenon of out of body experiences. You know, when, mm -hmm. when people um, at the end of life uh, mm -hmm. seem to die, then are resuscitated, and then give reports of things that happened mm -hmm. when they were supposedly dead in the mm -hmm. resuscitation room. Um, do you think that these that this phenomenon is evidence of some kind of mind body dualism, um, mm -hmm. or um, or, or is it is it something that can be explained in purely physical terms? I haven't done detailed study on out of body or near death experiences. I know there are countless um, um, uh, 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 stories of, of the, this happening, and uh, far more common than people realise. I think um, now. Some of them definitely appear to be uh, impossible without an, an actual re reality of leaving the body because certain things are, um, are said that the person who's left their body were, was aware of during the time people were trying to help them or they might have had brain injury or an accident or been unconscious or whatever it was. Um, so they, they bring reports then of, of that. I, I think skeptics will say, well, the brain is such a complex thing that during these sort of strange, strange times, uh, all sorts of um, illusions might happen. I, I'm a bit on the fence about this one. I'm cautious about every story that you hear, yeah. but I think there are some very credible ones. 
And yes, I, I didn't bring it into my talk because I, I, I do sit a bit on the fence for this one. But even in a, a, a major philosophy of mind journal, which I get, uh, there was a whole section on exactly this by some philosophers who are looking into it very carefully. Thank you. You you mentioned the um, you you mentioned sensation, personhood, private access, emotions, mm -hmm. and so on, as being evidences that there was something separate from the brain itself. You know that that. Um, the, the pointing towards substance dualism, and uh, well, you didn't mention conscience, but uh, uh, people yeah. will bring that up again as evidence. Yeah. And, and Adrian Chung here is asking, could you please comment on conscience? Is it similar yeah. to consciousness? Yeah, I, I didn't bring it up because it's it's related, but not strictly the same as studying consciousness. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by conscience and what, where morality comes from and why we have a conscience at all, even. And I, I think we, that's a whole other subject we could spend, spend this afternoon talking about because um, the fact that we have conscience and there are rules which are objective rules that we believe in, that it's wrong to do certain things, it's wrong to torture children, whatever it might be. Yeah in all societies uh, points to an objective reality to morality and therefore a rule giver who is not ourselves. In other words, God himself is the, 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 the one who gives us conscience and, what's, and we, we need to look into it. It, it is a fascinating subject. It's, it's a huge area that I think Christians should major on a bit more in discussing it with non-Christian people because um, when, it, when it comes to the crunch, uh, morality is something that's objective, not something you just decide yourself. And therefore it points to the objective rule giver, if you like. Yes, it's fascinating too, isn't it? How St. Paul in, in Romans uh, talks about uh, sin and, and, he, yeah. and our awareness of God, and he points to the the uh, wonders of the created order, first of all, in chapter one, chapter three, it's about the, the word of God revealed and how we fall short of it. But in chapter two, it's mm. about conscience and saying yeah. that people have, in a sense, a law written on their hearts, which exactly can tell them about yeah. this other dimension beyond. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. How much do you think uh, people's views on on the mind and body problem are shaped by their underlying worldviews? Because it, it seems to me uh -huh. it's, it's much more popular today, especially among secular materialists and, and some of them mm -hmm. very well educated, not to want to believe in any form of dualism at all, that, that mm -hmm. our minds are nothing yeah. other than our, our brains. Yeah, and there are Christians also who are monists, strangely enough, but... Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they uh, uh, I respect them, but read quite a lot of, of their work and uh, find it difficult to follow. But um, we live in a world where the spiritual and the supernatural and a theistic view of creation is in the Western world, I would say, is um, on, you know, waning and Within uh, philosophy departments, um, there are not that many Christian people or people who have a view of something supernatural beyond the material order. So they've done, basically, you'll have looked at all of these various isms, and there are many more that I tried to list. And most of them are trying to find a way to explain consciousness without the soul, without dualism because they have a world view and exactly the questioner has put their finger on it. They start with a world view that there is nothing more than uh, matter and energy, basically. Um, even though actually scientifically, there's, there's a lot of evidence that the universe itself was created from nothing. And uh, 
their a mind was behind that creation. But uh, we won't go down there just now. But the, the point I'm making is that all these isms, um, and if you look at any of these conferences and books by philosophers of mind, they're desperately trying to work out why we cannot explain consciousness. Mm. They can't, and the neuroscientists can't either. If you look at the latest neuroscience, we have an enormous amount of information now about pathways where certain uh, things to do with memory, vision, um, activity in the brain occur. Um, but as regards consciousness, nothing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. How uh, fruitful do you think these discussions are in terms of well, within the context of evangelism? If, one, if one's trying to establish a case for mm -hmm. uh, there being more than just matter, chance, and time, that the materialism isn't an adequate mm -hmm. worldview to explain observed phenomena, how, how useful do you think the, the question of the the mind and the body consciousness sensation is to uh, to to help people mm. admit the possibility of theism, but first of all, and then the, mm. the plausibility of Christianity. Do you, do you think these are these are fruitful lines of discussion with with non Christians? I do. I do yeah, I, I do think so, um, but it it has to be in certain contexts. Uh, it's just not where a lot of people are itching and uh, they're not not thinking about it so if there's somebody who's already uh wondering and open to thinking about these things then i do believe that talking about the evidence for something non-material about our consciousness and the fact that actually in in philosophy this is an absolute open question now it's not it's not just christians talking about that then then we certainly, it's, it's an opening that we can make to say, look, well, it's not just random physics. Uh, there's so much more going on. Yeah, I think so. Well, why do you think the, the concept of personhood or consciousness is so vexing and, and difficult and hard to get to the bottom of? I mean, you, you said it's one of the most controversial areas in philosophy, and mm. it really has been, hasn't it, for many many centuries why do i think it's difficult because i think it is difficult <laughs> because <laughs> we're trying to um work out something I, I think i think it's 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 beyond us looking at the pure mechanics of how the brain works um and uh, we will learn a great deal more about the brain we're just starting and uh, I, I think it's wonderful what neuroscience does but we seem to have this explanatory gap between what we know about the brain and what conscious experience is as something that a physical object just simply cannot seem to explain. And so people are coming up with all sorts of ideas. That chap, David Chalmers, that I mentioned, he's become, I think, something called a pan psychic person. In other words, <laughs> everything, all matter has the potential for consciousness, even atoms. But the more complicated you get, the more likely it is to become more real. It's like it's a sort of a, a new part of physics. You don't want to talk about anything supernatural, but uh, panpsychism is one of the, the latest thoughts. So it's, it's it's, this is why you've got whole departments and universities discussing these things at the moment, because it is such a puzzle. But I think as Christians, we have an answer and we, we should be very clear about where we are, about the soul, and not be afraid to say, look here, uh, the evidence actually is that there is a non-material part of us. And the studies of consciousness, neuroscience and philosophy points very strongly to that. We have a real case. Yes, yeah, so, well, the beliefs of Chalmers you've just described are really uh, seem quite bizarre in a way. I'm reminded of G.K. Chesterton, who said that the, the tragedy when people stop believing in God is not that they believe in nothing, but they believe in anything. 
And it, yes. it seems sometimes that people will adopt any conclusion they possibly mm -hmm. can as long as it stops them believing in Christian mm. theism and, and having to come to terms with the fact that there's a yeah. God to whom they have to relate. But uh, we're yeah. almost out of time. I just wanted to ask you one question in closing before we do close up. And uh, Anthony, you're, you're uh, something of a philosopher. You've studied this area, but you're also a GP who, who sees patients. And I wondered how uh, this study of the mind-body problem uh, has shaped or influenced the way that you practice medicine or look at, at patients. Good question. Um, I um, actually retired as a GP in December, so just stopped being a GP. But as regards how it's affected the way I look, I think it's helped me to look at every individual. Um, it, it's added to my faith in the fact that we are precious people made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. uh, we are souls. And so we can go down the line, if we're not careful in medicine and dentistry as well, to um, just see the disease. And uh, if you're a GP with only 10 minutes, <laughs> you're just struggling to, to get through the various symptoms that are there. But at the back, in the background of your mind, here is a person who's far more than that. And I think that's encouraging to us as Christians. And it gives us an opening as well, perhaps, to look for ways of sharing our faith where it's appropriate. Thank you so much. We've been listening to Dr. Anthony Latham on the subject, the enigmatic subject of the enigma of consciousness. It remains to me to uh, just to say thanks again, uh, Anthony, for such a stimulating talk, thought provoking talk. Uh, and for ex helping us to exercise our own souls and minds. Uh, and uh, may God bless you all. Look forward to seeing you again soon on ICMDA webinars. Thank you.